Hello everyone, welcome to Gerotic Motion's tutorial video. This is a tutorial video of the newest versions of uh, Gerotica. Uh, Gerotica has undergone a lot of GUI changes in the last year, so this will identify how to use the program and how to use its new menuing system to uh, clear up a few inconsistencies in the old videos. Uh, the most important thing of Gerotic Motion and its main, uh, its main reason for existence is the creation of gears, spur gears in particular. However, we've added a lot of other toys in the program, um, such as this main screen, which is our project and mechanism screen, um, to watch what a geared mechanism will do that you're designing. Let's take a look at uh, this main screen and explain some of the things on it so that you're clear as to how things work. Let's do that by creating a small project. You'll see along the top of the screen uh, where my mouse is now, we have project control, spur gears, lantern, elliptical, imaginary, ratchets and gadgets, spoken panel diagnostics, and a new one called non-circular shapes, which is a development tab uh, for future use. Uh, the project screen that you come up with, which is Project Control, has on its left-hand side a project database where a tree will develop as you add more gears to a mechanism. Let's add a couple so that we uh, get the idea and then I can explain some of the controls on the project screen. I'm going to select the Spur Gears tab, which takes us to a normal Spur Gear development screen. As you can see, I've got text on my screen, both on the left and the right, and the text is pretty much identical. And what it does is it explains the parameters of the gear on the left and the gear on the right. We typically refer to the gear on the left as being the wheel and the gear on the right as being a pinion. In proper terminology, the pinion is the small gear and the wheel is the large gear. However, since either gear can be made either to any size, uh, we'll continue to refer to the left-hand gear as the wheel and the right-hand gear as the pinion. And you'll find that this is represented in the menus. If we look to the top, you'll see wheel teeth and pinion teeth. Uh, one refers to the left-hand hand, the other refers to the right. Um, let's talk about the size of a gear for a second because this is one of the questions I get uh, quite a bit from users who are new to the program. They'll send me an email saying, I want a gear of a particular size. How do I arrange that? Well, the size of a gear is a combination of its module or diametric pitch and the number of teeth. They dictate the overall diameter of a gear. You don't specify a gear's diameter other than by specifying the number of teeth and the module. For example, this particular gear we're looking at on the uh, left-hand side, the wheel, is 22 teeth, as can be seen in the menu at the top. It's also a module 5, and if you look at the text on the screen, it tells us we have a gear diameter of 120 millimeters. If I was to change this to a module 4 gear, you can see now that the gear diameter up here in the left shows we have a 96 millimeter gear. This is because the module dictates the size of the tooth, and since the size of the tooth multiplied by the number of teeth on the gear uh, gives us the circumference that indicates what the end diameter will be. The end diameter is always a combination of the module and the number of teeth. If you're working in standard instead of metric, module will not be there and it will be diametric pitch or DP. This is the standard equivalent of module. We also have pressure angle, which normally for spur gears is set to 20 degrees, although in the old days it may have been as low as 14 degrees. Um, we have several options on this page. In addition to setting the module and the pressure angle, the pressure angle you normally leave alone and simply adjust the module or the number of teeth to get a gear of the proper diameter that you want. Uh, we also have a shaft diameter which can be set to uh, any number that represents the uh, shaft size that's going to be in the center of the gear. And we have spokes on or off. If we check spokes off, you can see the spokes disappear. Uh, spokes can be further controlled by the spoking panel. Whenever you're on any of the gear design pages, you can click the spoke panel and it will move over to um, show you 
a spoke control and a few diagnostic aids for those who, have, uh, who want to educate themselves more on how a gear is created. For example, I could turn on a root circle display and we can now see where the root circle is for that gear. For the spokes, we can select uh, different types of spokes, such as circular spokes, and the number of spokes that that gear will have to get a more decorative type of gear for you. The rim ratio, leg ratio, and boss ratio uh, control the thickness of the spokes, how far away they are from the center, and how thick your rim is going to be uh, after you've created this gear. So after playing with the spokes, you can click back on spur gears and you'll see that things um, have stayed the way that you've set them. We have a rotate button so that you can check to see how things uh, mesh up, how the teeth mesh up as two gears rotate together. Uh, we have a regenerate button in case you've changed any of the numbers and don't feel that they've automatically uh, been taken into account. And we have a library button which you can push to save a gear that you've designed in a list so that you can always get back at it easily. In addition to that, we have some special um, tooth modification variables such as profile shift, stub, and width that you can set for either gear. These are advanced settings and normally you shouldn't be using them unless you know exactly what the effects are of profile shift, stub, and width. So let's uh, take one of these gears. You'll see on the page is a button called create wheel or create pinion. Again, remember, wheel is on the left, pinion is on the right. So let's create one of these wheels. And we'll be asked a gear name. You're free to change it, but the program will um, label them as the type of gear and uh, a numerical order of the gear being created. And then we have a face width adjustment. This is how thick your gear is going to be. In this case, let's set mine to five because I want it five millimeters thick. And when you're placing your first gear, you needn't worry about this backlash correction um, variable. After creating your first gear, if you're going to mesh a gear to that first gear, the backlash correction um, can be used. And all it does is add a little bit of distance to the shaft to make the gears a little bit looser to create backlash on purpose. Most mechanical mechanisms that you create with gears have a little bit of backlash added. So in this case, let's say I add 0.2. Uh, it won't be used on this first gear, but it will be used on subsequent gears when you add them to this gear. So here we have our first gear. You can see that you can move it around. If we hit uh, both buttons at the same time on your mouse and move the mouse, you can move the gear around. If you hit your, uh, uh, your middle mouse button and rotate, uh, you can uh, rotate your point of field. All right, let's add another gear. Let's add the pinion gear here, and we'll do that by going back to the spur gear screen and hitting create pinion. We'll again be asked um, what the name is, and you can see that this one is now involute number two. Uh, the face width has defaulted to five to be the same size as the gear that I created before. And here's where backlash correction comes into effect. If I add uh, 0.5 as a number in the backlash correction and say OK. We're going to create a gear and place it on a shaft which will mesh it with the primary gear that we select and uh, give us a little bit of free space. Now the top of the screen when I said create this gear says place your gear. There's two methods of gear placement. You can either point to the gear itself, in which case the gear turns red. This tells you that the if you click your mouse you're going to place a gear like I just did, and you can rotate it around with your mouse to find the position that you want to place it in. Um, on the screen, you'll see it snaps to the 0 and 90 uh, and 180 and 270 positions just to make it easier to get straight across mechanisms, but you can place it anywhere you like. So let's place this gear in an arbitrary location. Again, with the middle mouse button, we can rotate the screen around. We can hit the rotate on off button and see how the two gears would rotate as a functional mechanism. We can turn off rotation. You can slowly step through the rotation of a gear with your counterclockwise and clockwise step. And you can see that our project screen on the left hand side of the screen now shows a tree. The tree is divided into shafts. We have two shafts in this particular mechanism. Obviously if you have two gears you need a minimum of uh, two shafts if they're not on the same shaft and the gear names are listed. Clicking on one of these gears 
we'll turn it red so that you can see that that is the gear you're currently selecting. And when you select a gear, you'll be provided with a series of uh, numerical entries on the screen showing you various facts and statistics about the gear, what the current uh, gear ratio is, what the speed of a particular gear that you have selected is, etc. Right-clicking on one of these gears will allow you to uh, bring up a sub-menu that allows you to rename the gear, just in case you'd like a name for that gear which is more intuitive to whatever you're doing. We can select Delete Train. Delete Train will delete that particular gear and any gears forward from it. In other words, if I have a, another gear rotating off of that gear, it too would be deleted. This is necessary because the program is kind of linear in its logic of gear-to-gear -gear manipulation. So it needs to keep track of what gear drives what gear because you can get hundreds of gears on the screen and uh, you always have to think of them as what comes off of this gear and what's behind that gear. So when you delete a train, you're deleting a gear and any gears that you created after that gear that are attached to that particular gear. Uh, we also have a selection run tool wizard which brings up a wizard that would allow us to create a uh, form shaped cutting tool. And there will probably be more types of form shaped tools in the future. However, that's how you reach that particular menu. Um, now we have two gears on the screen and they're rotating. Let's add a third gear so that we can see. I'm going to go back to the spur gear menu and let's add a pinion. And we're going to leave it as a five uh, millimeter face width and say OK. And you can see at the top of the screen it says select gear or shaft to place new gear. Uh, this is where if you point to a gear and it turns red, you're going to mesh to the outside of that gear. But if we want to place a gear on a shaft, if you point to the shaft, the gear turns purple. This means if you click now, you're going to be placing a gear on the shaft of that gear, which is purple. So if I click, I'm presented with a screen that shows the gear or the mechanism from the top. So we can now place the gear forward or back of the other gear and a shaft will automatically be created, which ties the two gears together. And now you can see that when I rotate, our third gear is locked to the shaft of our second gear and will rotate at the same speed. Now let's talk about some various types of gears because spur gears are not the only type of gear that you may want to create. On the spur gear screen, if we go back on the left hand side you'll see this uh, very narrow menu with the current type selected as spur. If I click down on epicycloidic you can see that what happens is both gears change their tooth type to an epicycloidic gear type. Um, these types of gears are kind of rare to use these days, except in clocks, perhaps. They have a fairly low friction uh, of run, so they're fairly popular in the old days with clocks, although a spur gear actually has the lowest friction of all the gears and uh, is actually a better gear to use in a clock when you get right down to it. But the cycloidics are somewhat prettier, so uh, a lot of people tend to like them. Then we have helical gears. You can see when I go helical, I'm going to turn off spokes so that they're not so confusing here. When I go to a helical gear, you can see that the teeth look somewhat squatter. This is because helical gears, by their nature, increase the size of the gear and change the tooth form um, to allow for helical gears to properly mesh. Let's create one of these so that you can see what I'm talking about here. But when you, first of all, let me explain, when you select a type of gear such as helical, if there are other parameters that are required, the dialog on the left will resize to give you the parameters that you need. For example, you can select a left-handed helical as opposed to the default right. You can select a helical angle. In this case, you can see it's defaulted to 45 degrees. You could select do not resize, which would be a very rare option. That would be if you want to fit a helical gear into a space where a normal uh, gear used to be, this would allow you to change a spur set to a helical set without changing shaft distances. Helical gears run faster than spur gears, and that's one of the reasons a person would want to do it. Let's create a helical gear, though. Let's add the pinion. And we're going to add this to the center gear shaft. You can see the first gear, I point to it. It turns purple because I'm pointing to its shaft. I click, and now my helical gear can be placed. So now you can see the difference between a spur and a helical. 
as you can see I haven't changed the number of teeth or the mod but the helical gear is larger this is the nature of helical gears uh, gear of the same module is slightly larger than the uh, than a non helical gear again there's technical reasons for that but this follows industry standards you can see that the teeth on this gear are helical in nature this allows two gears to sit uh, cross angled if you wish them to be um, each type of gear has its own peculiarities which you'll learn over time as you play with them let's go back to the spur gear screen so we can take a look at a couple more we have bevel gears bevel gears will look the same on the display screen but you can see that we have different options we have straight helical or zero all gears these are types of bevel gears and again if you're of a mind to make a helical uh, uh, to make a bevel gear you probably understand already uh, what the requirements are and what these parameters do to a uh, bevel gear let's create one just so that you can see how it how it looks and how it gets created I'll pick the shaft of one of these gears and move it up and now you can see what the bevel gear looks like um, in the program when you're trying to add gears to the screen it will only allow proper gears to uh, be connected to each other you cannot create for example a bevel gear and connect it to a spur gear the two are not matched the program won't let you do it but if I was to create now a small bevel gear of the same type as our first one I am free to select that bevel gear select where I wish it to be click and the gear will fold in and give us a proper bevel gear you can see the two bevel gears uh, there now rotating in their proper form as you can see the screen can start to get a little complex because you can change directions of your shafts and gears if I go back to the spur gear screen and select a normal spur gear again I could create one and selecting the center of that second bevel gear we made I can place that gear and now you can see it's sitting off of a shaft of the uh, bevel gear 90 degree changes are accomplished by bevel gears but uh, you can achieve various angles from different degrees of a bevel gear or from helical gears which cross at, at different angles this means that your shafts and mechanisms and gears can shoot off in almost any direction in your mechanism this can be a little hard on the head but work at it and uh, you'll find that it gets a little intuitive over time um, let's take a look at the spur gear screen again and you can see that we have a type of gear called a four bar gear um, this is explained in other videos and I'll uh, let you play with those it's a very rarely used uh, type of gear for most people's mechanisms and then finally we have timing pulleys timing pulleys are industry standards uh, we have about 20 types of them here if we select a gear like XXL you can see that the you can see that the gear which is created has the XXL pulley type tooth timing pulley gears do not mesh together you can place them on the screen and place them apart from each other and calculate from there what size belt you would use when you place these on the project screen they will automatically be placed at a distance applicable to a belt of a particular length belts of course have to be in a integer number of teeth so the distance between pulleys uh, are important it is it's important that the distance between pulleys allow for a belt uh, which can be purchased in order to join them together the program will automatically take care of such considerations uh, that's it for the spur gear screen that's pretty much all that's on it that you really need to worry about there are extra little toys that you can play with which you'll pick up over time as you learn how to use the program if we look at some of the other types of gears we have cage and lantern gears for example um, these are gears which uh, were seen in some old clock mechanisms and so on it's basically a wheel with several bearings or uh, bars on it which mesh into a um, sprocket like gear uh, to get motion we can increase or decrease the number of teeth on any one of the gears and we can even select an internal gear and put uh, one gear inside the other gear 
next to lantern, we have elliptical gears. Elliptical gears are um, very different type of gearing. It's very unusual to see them in, in practice. They're fun to play with and fun to make mechanisms from, however. And elliptical gears come in various various forms which are controlled by you. In addition to the teeth, we have the order of a gear. Uh, a gear could be first order, second order, third order. And the way to think of this is that basically how many sides that gear will have. A third order elliptical gear is actually a triangle, as you can see in this first gear that I have. A fourth order elliptical gear is a square gear. And a first order elliptical gear is an ellipse. And two elliptical gears running together also have a very strange rotation pattern. And this is something that um, you can play with as, as mechanisms. On the GearHeads forum, you'll see several examples of people who have made some cool-looking giz gadgets and gizmos out of elliptical gears. Uh, the rule in an elliptical gear, though, is that you should keep your maximum pressure angle below 40 and you can see that the gears I have on the screen right now are a pressure angle of 46, which means they'll probably run a little rough, a little tight. You cannot change maximum pressure. This is something which is inherent on uh, the other parameters that you've used to design your gear. Normally, lowering your eccentricity will lower your pressure angle. So if we take it from a 0.6 to a 0.5 eccentricity, you can see my maximum pressure has fallen to 40. And 40 is just about the perfect number to get a smooth running elliptical gear. So if you're playing with ellipticals, um, keep your eye on the maximum pressure variable. Keep it below 40 and you should get a pretty good meshing elliptical gear. More work will be done on ellipticals in the future as we try to move to a general toothing algorithm which will hopefully tooth any shape. Next to that, we have imaginary gears. Um, these are just decorative gears, very rarely used, but they can be fun to put on a um, small mechanism to impress people with, uh, with your acumen in creating a gear. As you can see, when we go to the screen, we only have one gear, and this is because they are randomly made, and hitting random mas master will give you various shapes of an imaginary gear. In order to get its mate, you have to click the gear that says make pinion. And if I hit the make pinion gear, we can see our status bar at the top begins to go up. This is a very complex operation, so it takes a, a minute or so to generate the slave to a uh, imaginary gear. And there we have it, and if we hit rotate, you can see how the gears mesh up. You should keep your eye on uh, the rotation of an imaginary gear and rotate them a few times to make sure that there is uh, not a situation where the two gears would jam up or fail to turn each other. It's quite possible to get some pretty weird imaginary gears going, and there's no guarantee that all combinations will work. But by carefully looking at the gear that you're getting, you can make a determination yourself as to whether these particular gears would uh, rotate well. And if they will, you're free to use them. Uh, we then have ratchets and gadgets. Ratchets and gadgets allow us to make things such as these um, ratchets, which typically will be used in a clock as part of their escape me mechanisms. There's various types of uh, ratchets. You can have a recoil, such as this one, or standard ratchet. You could flick it to counterclockwise or clockwise control. Uh, also on the screen, we have add clock hand and add crank handle. These are used on the project screen in order to give you a visual indication of a gear which is turning. Let's select add clock hand, for example. And you can see when we go, it takes us to our project screen, and we're now, we now want to select a shaft. So if I select this shaft here, for example, uh, we can place on the screen a clock hand. And as you can see, it's kind of handy to see visually just where, where is that shaft pointing at this current time. One note to that is uh, as you speed up your your gears rotation, it can begin to look as if your gears aren't moving or they're moving backwards. This is due to the refresh rate on your screen and that's why sometimes it's good to have a clock hand because the clock hands are not as susceptible 
to this um, screen refresh phenomenon, so it gives you a better idea of how your gears are moving. You can also, of course, check the reverse checkbox and watch your gears move backwards. Well, that's it for a general introduction into how to use the program. You're going to find some various other options to use in the creation of your gears, but that's part of gearotic motion is that options are being added and subtracted uh, at various times through the program's development. So playing with the program is the best way to figure out how to use it. However, to generate specific gears that you need, I think you now have enough information to actually create them. Final thing that we have to look at then is how do I get output from these gears in order to create them on my CNC. And there's a button on your main screen called Output Manager. This is a batch file creator and it creates a lot of files depending on what you're doing. And it creates the files off of whatever files you have selected. Going to our tree, you can see if I click on a gear, it highlights in red and gives us data. If I hold down my control key while I select these gears, each of the gears will select one at a time and you can select multiples of them. Then when we hit Output Manager button, we're presented with a screen of various options that we can output for those gears. Let's say, for example, that we want a 2D DXF of our first gear uh, indicator 8, which is really just the clock hand. We would select 2D DXF as our option for that gear. And perhaps we wish to put out a 3D DXF as well, so we can select that. Now if I select a different gear on the screen, such as Involute 1, you can see the checkboxes disappear. This means that you can select individual options for whatever gear that you have selected and then hit Create Output and those outputs will be created. Sometimes though you don't want to go right through the list, so if we just go to Indicator 8 and we check 2D DXF and 3D DXF, we can check a box that says Copy to All Gears. This now will tell the program every gear is to be considered for those options. But you may have other gears such as Influt 1 that we want to put out a 2.5D milling G-code for. If so, we can select that gear and then check the option. Now if you do select uh, G-code output, we have NC parameters on the right which you have to consider. Tool diameter, safe Z height, feed rate, plunge rate, step over ratio, these should all be fairly familiar terms to you if you're going to CNC something. Climb mill will tell us to reverse the direction from clockwise to counterclockwise in cutting these objects. Uh, on some of the gears, such as spur gears, you could put the mode as fourth axis G-code. We have um, options such as convert helical to knuckle and so on. These will all be covered in an output manager video uh, that better explains the individual options that are available for each gear. You needn't consider those most of the time and this video is really meant to show you a generalization of how to use the program. So by looking carefully at what options you have on the screen and then hitting create output, um, that's how you generate your general output. When I do hit create output, you can see I'm asked for a project name. The reason I'm asked this is because it has sense that I haven't yet given the project a name. It is titled then untitled. So if we give it a name such as video and hit OK, a directory has now been created in our gear output folder called video which will have all the various files which um, we've just requested. And the file list can be quite large. Uh, even if you haven't selected a type of output, various output types will still be put out. You'll get a, a compensated DXF, for example. You'll get a parameter file which tells you what the selection parameters were used to create that file. I encourage you to look through those files and see what exactly is available to you as a designer to use. The program puts out uh, more information than most people would require. and. Uh, that's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing because you'll usually find that there is the data there that you need for a particular project. You can also create off of this main screen a video if you hit the record AVI button uh, it will create a five or ten second video for you that you can send to friends or post on websites or the forum uh, to show what your mechanism does and what it looks like.
So more videos will come out in future to explain some of these options more deeply and those videos demand will be based on questions that I get on the form, things that I know that we have to further explain to people. And before we exit this video, uh, let's look at two important buttons over on the right hand side of your menu bar beside the uh, progress display. We have a world button with a little chain which is our settings and if we point to it it tells us this is the settings button. In the settings we can set a default data folder. I personally create a folder on my desktop called gear data that I use but the default is in the gearotic motion folder and that's where you'll find your uh, gear data but you're free to change, change that with the browse button here. We can also change program units between English and metric. And a point that you need to realize is the gear point distance underneath the selection. It should always be um, fairly low. This is the distance between points on the gear which is being created. And when I say distance between points, I mean all the individual points which make up a gear have an inherent distance between them. This gear point distance sets that. So that's it for a general introduction to uh, Gearotic Motion. We hope that you enjoy playing with it and don't forget to join the GearHoids forum so that you can uh, post your questions or add suggestions on other things that you'd like to see in the program. Have fun. See ya.